thought the best way for me to perhaps um, start off the session would be to ask if anyone um, had now in mind uh, any topic or question which uh, had been raised and about which they would like to hear more. If there were any opportunities which had not been completely developed and which people would like to talk about. And so I can start from that way. Yeah. I just want to ask a, a follow-up from uh, our last panel, but I think it, in general, bears on say I'm fascinated with the transition in the 80s when uh, it seemed the criticism changed. And it changed, I think, that Don gave us a vignette of the change in criticism of the change in music or whatever. You can, it's, it's narrativized in different ways sometimes, like the demonstrative or whatever. But, but actually, a striking moment, and Jonathan alluded to this, was, was the moment of, of the Boundary 2 conference. And I'm not sure exactly which one I interviewed Spanos, and he, he told me about the collection that came out. But I forget, in 86, that a collection, there's something of interpretation came out from it. Do you know? The volume, I mean. So you're referring to the volume that he and I and uh, Dan O'Hara edited, if so that's much earlier. Oh, so that's, that's okay. But anyway, that the, the transition from in, in that moment, it, vaguely in the year when, when Don was talking about it, that seems to me it would be a, a fine vignette of what was going on in criticism. And I wish my students had, had, had stayed to hear about it, because <laughs> it's an inconsistent history. Whereas I'd like to hear how you would recount it, that it became sort of the era of Sayyid, is how I would mark it after that. So this was the after era of Virginia, Virginia, I think. The meeting with Virginia wasn't that 1982? No, that was like 78. Eugenio event was the first or the second of those two big meetings. No, you're quite right. The Eugenio event was in the 70s. Uh, you're not really asking me, you're asking the whole Yeah, thing. I, I would be curious of what. Uh, Jonathan would say, or you would say, about about that that moment, and if there was in fact a transition. I remember in that era too. I, I remember there was a, an ad that Harvard University Press uh, ran, uh, like in '90 or '91, that literary history of the back. So it was supposed to be the end of deconstruction and the beginning of something else. And this might end, speak to also what John Beverly was saying. You know, maybe this kind of criticism was. Uh, more palatable, precisely because it wasn't as polemicized as, as a Marxist person would have been. That might be one. Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? John, when did you edit that uh, English Institute volume on, on the consequences? The consequences of theory volume was papers given, I think, in. 87 and 88 of the volume actually appeared in uh, 90 or 91, but uh, Barbara Johnson and I in successive years organized uh, panels. Uh, you know, mine had uh, uh, Cornell West, Bruce Stone, um, Nancy Fraser. Nancy Fraser, yes. And uh, you know, Guy Tree, Anthony. Anyway, that, that, was a, that was late 80s. So that was that was a point at which it was it was felt that something had happened that you could begin to start summing up or what next day. There are alternative ways of recounting, of course, the period to which you occur. Who will recall how easy it was for anti-theory people in the US and in the UK? Colin McKay was sadly not here, but he would be a living instance of it. He does send fraternal ladies. Uh, I'm very glad to receive those readings. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, looking behind me is always necessary. So, <laughs> uh, Where there's a brother, there's a back. Yes. Oh, my God. That's tough enough. But you will remember the ease with which people in many different places on the political spectrum, could elide what was called theory, what was called Marxism. It was a movement as easily made as that which elided theory with Neil. So the, and those, those gestures all preceded the election of Reagan, 
and it had something to do with the rise of Thatcher. I suppose at least they were contemporary to the rise of Thatcher. I would think that uh, there are other 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 points here. I mean, I would I would say, given the long history of the last thirty years or so in the academic fields in the United States, that the rhetoric of the theories of Marxism has thrived a lot. It's constantly present in the domain of what calls itself the alienated and entangled and resistant left. Beginning with remarks by, I offer as a remark, Andrew Ross's comment at the American Studies Association meeting whenever uh, Bush had begun his war that, and I quote, the American Studies Association is political <coughs> opposition to George Bush. There are foolish remarks I was there. When yeah, there are foolish remarks, and that's among the most foolish such remarks. Um, there's a certain easy antagonism which exists between uh, an academic left in the US that has uh, self identified itself as Marxist by embracing the Jamesonian articulation of what is left Marxist. Um, and that modality chooses to, as John said a few minutes ago, to position as alternative and unacceptable alternative almost all other series of practices and scopes. While the anti Said, anti Demand, anti Foucault, anti Heidegger. In the early 80s and since, I saw no anti Jameson wave in the academy anywhere. And I simply haven't ever seen that in the academy. And on the contrary, I well, there was a debate about the third world now. Yes, well, that, but that, 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 that itself is a relatively localized family argument. Fred is the only person to have won all three of the MLA's major awards yes. for an well, essay, I mean, a book, and a career. Yes. <laughs> He's kind of the Fonzie bear. And I'm, I'm a, I myself have said in, in, in writing, and at some, with some authority, that the political unconscious is the last great work of classical criticism. Because I think that it helped to end the problem. Desire to do so. So I don't I don't accept the formulation of your question because I think it begs too many questions about competing narratives. Um, and in fact, prejudges the circumstances. I don't think that Saeed was an easier fit in the age of Brady than, for example, Stanley Fisher or Walter Ben Michaels, who were the perfect instances of that. Or even some self-important white men who announced themselves to be undervalued because their whiteness and their anti-imperialism uh, kept them from being properly honored. I think of Tim Burton and Mike Springer and others. Glenn Trisha. Glenn Trisha is a different case. Mary Trisha. Oh, Mary Trisha. Sorry. <laughs> so I think there are other ways of tell telling the story, positioning people differently. <coughs> and I do, well, I'll give you an example of one of the other things that annoys me about some of these, these terms of discussion. I told this little story the other day. I, I've been on leave, so I'm not here, fortunately. <laughs> but on Tuesday, I, I was here, and uh, a junior, relative of a junior colleague of mine, Someone came up to apologize for not having, not, not being able to come. This, this made her distinct <coughs> my colleague, um, for apologizing that she couldn't come. I said, she was very busy. I said, I'm sure you are very busy. And she said, also, I'm not very interested in Saeed's stuff. I really want to talk to who knew Edward. I told that story to him. I just laughed because, of course, this could be nothing more horrible than Edward Saeed's imagination than the notion there should be Saeed's studies. That, <clears throat> however, to, uh, to invoke the old echoes of Alphazir, if you will, seemed to me symbolically very important, symptomatically important. Because the colleague can only think, work, in the terms of feel, therefore, studies. And I, I think one of the things we've 
students today is an estimate of the day before, is the trace of Edwards' value. Here we come back to the question, not quite a singularity, but we can approach it. You see the value of Edward as exemplary. And it is very hard to imagine a truly exemplary figure offering him or herself either as the object of the studies or as the um, Socrates, not to Phaedrus, but to any one of his antagonists except Aristophanes in the symposium. Right. So there's no, there's no leadership question there. And I would find it very hard to know, furthermore, who would be identified in, say, 1988 to 1999 as a study. Who was it who was writing criticism that we would recognize instantly as in the style of Edward Said, as opposed to all those who might have had footnotes to say the political unconscious, or who might have defined postmodernism on the basis, for instance, of Jameson's reading of a hotel? So I think, if nothing else, the brutality of speaking out as an editor, the brutality of the citation index. Would fill some role. I've also done a little interesting work. You know this, the Google allows you to track the history of references and searches. I think it was when I was writing the torture book for the Hong Kong lecture that I discovered that starting about 10 years ago when Saeed died, um, the Google searches for Saeed in the world grew exponentially. Mm -hmm. The Google Said searches in the United States fell through the floor. <laughs> Correspondingly, the searches for Stanley Fish grew mm -hmm. exponentially, in part, of course, explained by his presence in the front page of the New York Times digital edition. Whereas the search for, uh, Frederick for uh, Stanley Fish outside the US is minimal, and that minimal is all based in the UK. Mm -hmm. right. Furthermore, when Saeed died, I think we there on the MLA organized a yes, major sure. event. We were on the podium, right? Yeah. Michael Wood, and uh, who else was there? I forgot. A cluster of ten of us, right? For this Dina team. Gassim, uh, Toby Sievers. Yes, I was sitting with Toby you yeah. and myself. Uh, Michael yeah. Wood, Guy Trio. Anyway, so the guy wasn't there. No, it wasn't there. That's right. <laughs> the point of this was that the MLA, anticipating that Saeed's recent death, which is also the death of a recent president of the MLA, would be a matter of some importance. And they had put this event together in a very large room. And in that room, among other things, what happened was a video was shown of Saeed's final public lecture that was given with the approval of the Soros Foundation, which is Edward's last place of public speech before his death, where he was raging against his own former students among others, for failing to stand up publicly on the matter of the Second uh, Iraq War. But the important point here was there was no one in the audience. We speakers, along with Edward's family and our spices and spouses and friends, utterly and absolutely outnumbered a handful of small academics who bothered to attend. Yeah, two months after that session. So I'll remind you again of James Swinney's career work. So I, I, I think your, your question's important. I was really just tying in more to John's question. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's a question that should be answered. Be oh, I think we've already answered that question just now. But I actually meant <laughs> not to. Uh, I didn't mean it as a popularity contest, Paul. I meant yeah, what, is, what was Zayn's relationship to Marxism? It was that, I don't know. As, as Amr said a few minutes ago in the, in the intermission, as it were, the answer to that is that Marxism is, if, see, if Marxism is within the academy, which is how I believe you put the question, right, then Marxism is not of interest because it's not criticism. That's what you're saying. No, I think that's that's what exactly you performed it perfectly when you said, I was not interested in him because he was not a Marxist. No, no, I was interested in him, but I found him frivolous. I read it. And I like, and I still read Doug a lot, not with great passion, but I read them. But I. Professor Ariel was frivolous. No, Ariel was the big. Now, 
It's interesting because <laughs> most people who were theoretically fine <laughs> thought that Orientalism was slightly frivolous, but the beginnings were yeah. yeah. Well, look, I'm just telling a little autobiography. I mean, you've all done little autobiography. So yeah. my little autobiography, you were at the English Institute yeah. here, yeah. you were here, yeah. you were there. Yeah, so there. Well, I'm, very, I'm resisting most of the autobiographical advice. Oh, I don't think so. I know it's just about it. I just one one English institutes, and then no, we were there. No, I myself and Edward, Edward, the Edward, and this, there are the Edwards, and there are the Zaids in the room, right? Uh, but I'm really, in, I'm really, we're postponing the question. No, no. What was Zaid's relationship to Marxism? It depends, I think, in the answer to that question. What is it that you think the word Marxism refers to? Fine. Right. Tell me what you think that is. Well, that's not my job. Well, but I'm raising the question so anybody can answer it. Nobody this seems to want to answer it. But this is seem to say, well, oh, Jameson's this terrible guy who's going to have a The question uh, that resonates as well with the continual question that was put to Foucault. Right, to which I offer the holding response and see if that's satisfactory. After Marx, how can we not be Marxists? That was one version of his shorthand answer to the question. But if you're asking the question, why would a critic not be a Marxist, then I think the answer has already been given. Because it's not only a question of what is Marxism, but what is criticism, and what we've been dealing with. Since Joe first began to speak, apologizing for the fact that he would speak at too great length, is we have been trying to work on the question of criticism and its relationship, among other things, to the specifically, but not exclusively, literary form of the function of imagination. So it is not in our business, because it's not our primary task, to ask and answer for others the question of what they think Marxism might be. Those who have that question would do Mar best work. Wouldn't Marxism have something to offer to the task of literary or music criticism? Remain, I mean, remain, remain, have, remains to be shown. In any philosophy case, of modern music, for example. But you, I mean, well, let's, let's, let's people who haven't spoken yet. I, mean, I, I, will, I will try really hard to speak to you. Yes. Opposition without polarization. I wonder if you said a little bit more about that, Jonathan, and whether that might help to. Uh, to, to further elaborate on this question of the relationship with Marxism, I'm going to have to go pretty soon. <laughs> um, yeah, so if, if you can say, I mean, and, and does that have anything to do with the question of style, with, with Said's style, um, opposition without polarization? Well, I, I'm not sure that I reached the, uh, the clarity of the formulation opposition without uh, without uh, polarization, but um, the, you know, the, the 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 direction I had moved was 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 one that uh, worked with the notion of alternatives, uh, and I suppose depending on who you are, alternatives either will or won't be a polarization. That is, uh, a, to add to add something. May may be uh, may be a form of supplementation, and somebody who's been, who has been supplemented may feel attacked. So you can't. I don't think you can predict your your sense that style is an issue. I absolutely agree with. In you know in the the direction I would go, which you or others can try to uh, locate in relation to the specific problematic you pose, taking it from me to be sure. Uh, with regard to the question of Said and, and Marxism is that from my point of view in reading the work of Edward Said, I find him engaging actively both to criticize and to make use of a wide range of figures who themselves are categorized by people who do categorizing as Marxists. But Fact is, all of those categories are themselves, from the point of view of others, uh, debatable. That is, you know, Adorno, Marxist or not. I mean, from one point of view, a, a scion of, of the Cold War establishment in, in Germany once he went back. Uh, from the point of view of the New Left, not our boy. But uh, 
on the other hand, within the canon of Marxist criticism, such as those who establish a canon of Marxist criticism, the staff chief is there. Likewise, as I as I kept saying to John, but you know, he Saeed talks at length about Lukash. Well, there is less ambiguity. I, yeah, right? <laughs> less, amb less ambiguity, but but also, of course, Lukash was you know, was at various times under threat of death by the communist cause that he embraced. One of the things that we haven't talked about, but certainly bears on Saeed, is. It mean, it's different to be a, a Marxist or not, depending on your relation to an existing communist party as a political force within your your political environment. I think that's what's, what's crucial. Jameson in the politics of interpretation in the academy took up a theoretical model that because of the absence of trade union party mm -hmm. and because of the absence of a communist party in the United States, maintained uh, let's call it uh, a theoreticist inflection. And that enabled uh, Jameson to uh, establish what I would call, and I don't mean this as any discrediting of, of Fred Jameson, who I much admire, but a position of Marxism without Marxism. That is a, um, a position um, that solicited a range of, of theorists who wanted what could be called the aura of political uh, opposition without the substance. And part of the genius of Fred Jameson is uh, to enter into that uh, particular set of formulations after North Pride had uh, made way for a certain version of structuralism. When Jameson turns Marxism rather than Fry's uh, myth uh, archetypes as the ultimate horizon of interpretation. He's tacitly deploying both uh, Fry uh, and um, continental uh, philosophy as vanishing mediators to sustain a purely theoreticist relationship uh, to Marxism. And uh, that uh, glamour uh, sustained itself. I don't think that uh, Saeed could, uh, because he was deeply committed to uh, a geopolitical uh, question that had real consequences in terms of uh, outcome and could not be reduced to, uh, let's call it, uh, uh, the conscience of theory. But um, had to have a practical outcome. He saw how uh, Marxism could be used to trap persons in the United States, for example, during the Cold War and afterwards under, in quotes, terrorism, to uh, positions of uh, warranted statelessness because they were rendered more or less indistinguishable from uh, the He saw the political realities on the ground in the United States. And he, as has been suggested by many of the speakers who have much greater connection to society's political efficacy and lamentably do I know that he was a figure who wanted to produce a modality of force in the public world. He wanted efficacy in the public world. And he wished thereby to eliminate all of the obstacles to that efficacy uh, that would otherwise saturate a political economy. You're nothing but a communist. Uh, so uh, Saeed was a very, I think, true tactical politician. And through his deployment, I don't, uh, uh, Gramsci, you can't eliminate Gramsci from his, uh, from his thing. Uh, he had also a profound understanding of the way in which to produce blocks, political blocks, uh, that uh, could also exert force. Uh, Saeed uh, worked on multiple axes um, simultaneously without over-determining any one of them. 
That was his genius. That was his style. He also, just to add a quick thing to what Don just said, he also had a certain severity about him in his articulation of judgment. The 78 conference, which Jonathan alluded to with Virginia Bonato and so on. But also at, a, at another event, which I think got in the year, which Stanley Fish challenged Saeed for not being a revolutionary because he wore a hood club. It was an interesting moment. But then there's the very famous one, which is reproduced in the essay Left American Literary Criticism. The, there are two versions of that essay that are slightly different. There's the journal version, which is harsher, and then there's the book collected version, which is more softened. And in the lecture, the journal version, when Saeed is surrounded by uh, both uh, people who do deconstruction and people who are self associated with the Jimson side of the literary critical world, his response was to say, I stand up and I listen to everybody talking about the world being overthrown. And then he makes the famous statement from Martian, where he was the earth now, and hear all this discussion about the end of ontotheology, the overthrow of capitalism, and so on and so forth. The Martian would then look around and say, well, has changed, which the answer was, of course. Not yeah, I mean, a crudum way of putting it might simply be, in answer to your question, I think for Saeed, as for many of us actually who come from the kind of places that, that, that he and I came from, uh, the idea of an academic Marxist is a little bit of a comical idea, okay? Um, to call oneself a Marxist where I grew up was an act of enormous courage. It could get you killed, it could get you jailed and tortured. It could get you fired. fired. Not Marxist. just communist Marxist, okay? Marxist. It would get you fired. Yeah. But this idea that you can you can be in the ivory tower and be shaking the, 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 the foundations of the world, okay, was a little bit comical for him. You okay. couldn't do that. And, and, and there thing. is something in what Perry Anderson called Western Marxism, okay, this, the, the post-1920s Marxist, institutionalized Marxism, that, that is, there is a little bit of a, of a double comicality and pathos, it seems to me, okay, to being an academic Marxist in the West. And uh, to, to bring a kind of radical critique of ways of thinking that are, that are judged in the way that you were judging them uh, a minute ago, I find a little comical. Job, I have to tell you that, okay? Uh, uh, simply given backgrounds, I don't think it's, it's really much more than that. Anyway, so I think that's part of his kind of irritation at, well, uh, I think I would at, at the yeah. isming of, yeah. of, of criticism. You know? okay. what, uh, what Don has suggested, though, is he's pointed in another way because the, the survivability of Marx's discourse in the academy paradoxically depends upon the ability of a figure or a set of small number of figures to, to replicate themselves and to generate certain concepts, uh, the functionality of which seems to lie in their reiteration and the, the, the uh, certain kind of allegiance that comes from the practice of that reiteration. We've said repeatedly that Edwin Said's project was, of course, whether you make it a matter of individuation or not. Edward Said's process required that no such shibboleths be brought into being, and wherever they could be found, if you call it a concept, I think you would say this about a concept, or you call it a commodity, or you call it a phrase, or you call it a cliche, that thing which threatens to stabilize the movement of language and therefore of thought, to obstruct the possibility of the burdens of learning and the possibilities of thought, Play of thinking, all of that was an obstruction of what it meant to be a human being. So I think in a severe way, that would mean that the Jamesonian project is but not a human being, but is in Marxism to the, to the Jamesonian project. Oh, but this, this, yeah. this, this, this your man said his factory spin back for Well, and also <laughs> there's, there's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's, there's an aspect of, of what Don said that I think that's rather important, and it has to do with an honor's allowed in this um, uh, it has to do with the question of, of uh, on the ground to the result. And, and that allows for, if I may, a reformulation of your question, right? And that is not what, what was his relationship to Marxism, but what was his relationship or engagement with Marxist? And, and beyond the US Academy, uh, with the French, with the British, uh, in Beirut, and in Cairo, Edward had an engagement with Marxist, in which these issues 
about what, what, is, what is the nature of the human world, the possibilities of political activity, were at stake. And, and it's worth revisiting uh, uh, you know, uh, those conversations. So he wasn't nebulous about it. He made a very important strategic situation, and one recognizing geopolitics. Indeed, in the US context, Marxism has a very specific valence, which is of the order of the abstract. I mean, there was a, a major Gramsci conference held at Duke this past April. I was in attendance, I was the speaker. And all of these few individuals, Stanley Aramis was there, the president's mm -hmm. there, who introduced themselves to me for part, were talking about Gramsci, and we're talking about the pertinence of Gramsci's question about revolution in this moment. And for the first morning session of three hours, I sat and I listened. I spoke in the afternoon. And not once was Tunisia mentioned. Not once was Egypt mentioned. Not once. Although Fred spoke at great length of the need to be able to engage as intellectuals with current moments of insurrection. But it was so abstract and theoretical. And of course, I had to speak from the floor on this. To which Cosimo said, well, this is a good question. It's too complicated to answer. <laughs> Direct quote. You're, you're not saying that, Ronald, quote. that Marxists have not thought about what's going on. In I'm, not, I'm saying that what Amr is describing and what Don is describing, right. describing, what Amr is describing and what Don is describing and what Edward rightly understood would be a kind of shibboleth that Paul speaks of, was I, I on understand. display and performed so much so that Stanley afterwards, and in fact, on my panel, I said, I've got a long paper about Gramsci, and I'm not going to give it on these people's going on. I understand that. And, and they even admitted this. They admitted this limitation to their theorization that has no political toehold, except nostalgically. I mean, they talk, Stanley, I, I talk I, for I, 30 I, minutes I, I, about I, the 30s. I and, regret becoming a Marxist. I mean, when I, became, <laughs> when I joined the American Socialist Party, my dad said, you're never going to get a job in the State Department. And you have all the moral capital you have to ask that kind of question. But don't hijack Edward by way but of producing my a, a question, is a question that is itself not trying. That is itself dogmatic. Yeah, I'm dogmatic. And you're dogmatic too. <laughs> Problem. You, you could say that there's this, I hate to use this word, but he's a Nietzsche, but there's a, you could say he's a pragmatist too, right? I mean, strategy is a pragmatic strategy of developing a radical, it's so definitely a radical, we're all the same. radical we're all the same. political we're all the same. voice in the American Academy by foreclosing and identifying it to a social gamma. However, this was uh, the now that we have addressed this question, which has been left over from previous questions, <laughs> are there others that? But I don't think that Jeff's question is traditionally. Can, can I just say a comment too? Because I actually, I mean, Saeed does answer the question about Marxism in the end. He basically says he has affinity for it. I mean, as you said, I think rightly, it is he works with Marxism or whatever. So I, I don't find that as pressing an issue as you do. And and uh, but my question is more like both talks talked about the 80s, and I was trying to draw you out to talk about, say, the 80s, and what happened. Was it the age of Sayyid? Also, yes, I think where I began, the reason how I did this I did was because the phrase, the age of Sayyid, seemed to me to be completely unjustified, right. well, that's both in the sense that I don't recognize the historical reference, and you offered no justification for that phrase. So it can answer the But let's let's uh, uh, people oh, let's go back. Let's go back. Well, people make people say all sorts of silly things. The, the, the after sight, after the demand in quotes um, incident, uh, the academy became a site for what was called a cult or cult, culture wars uh, that became the the, the umbrella the the beneficiary of that was cultural stuff, which produced a, a whole set of reorganizing tropes uh, that simultaneously sustained but also disallowed uh, certain forms of uh, intellectual debate and intellectual discussion. Uh, Saeed brilliantly, I think, understood how to position uh, his own way of thinking uh, 
in the gaps and uh, omissions of the culture wars. Uh, because that's a form of oppositional thinking that thrives on polarizations. And although cultural studies emerged because of what was perceived as a certain loss of uh, valuation for the literary, uh, cultures, cultural studies emerges at a moment in which the philological dimension of literary studies is getting displaced by, by a whole range of alternative discourses. And cultural studies is uh, filling in the site which literary studies is dubious of its object. Cultural studies begins to produce a whole range of uh, alternative material objects of inquiry that utilize the, the forms of close reading uh, generated within philology. But to disallow a recognition of the questions uh, produced by theory about philology. And its means of foreclosure is precisely the kind of, uh, let's call it, vulgar uh, polarization that the Devon incident allowed. If you're theory, you're a fascist. If you're in, in theory, you're authoritarian. If you're in theory, you're doctrinaire. Uh, so Edwards, I think, really brilliant positioning in um, the culture wars was to introduce culture and imperialism as a text that complicates in a way that disallows uh, those dead ends oppositions. And um, Said is, instead of engaging in the content of the culture wars, functioning as a referee to an elsewhere that's always already lost, by the way. So Said did not, uh, I, I, I slightly disagree that Said, I think Said uh, was uh, a very sustaining presence uh, throughout the so-called culture wars, who constantly called attention to cultural studies as a symptom of a whole set of questions that the academy was not acknowledging and refusing. Um, I, I've already told John in the intermission what I thought of his problem, but I, and, and pardon me, I don't have to really create just, reiterate just a couple of things. Um, but because the, because the discussion it really is temporary, very precise, inevitably, even though I don't want it to do this, the, the autobiographical or the impressionistic elements of experience come into it. Um, and uh, I went to graduate school in 1981. Uh, and uh, a, in California, okay, this is the location is important. Um, at that particular point, as a non-American in an American university who was uh, involved in the left uh, since uh, in my, since my teens, though not obviously the dogmatic left, meaning not anything else to the Communist Party, uh, I remember, and it wasn't just my impression, but the impression of my peers, my fellow students, that. There were two great leftist thinkers in the world of cultural criticism, Fred Jameson and Edward Said. This was not something that was even debated, uh, nor was there any kind of, of uh, question about it. At the same time, um, their relationship, and, and I, I have to mention this, what brought them together was a Frankfurt School yeah. orientation towards aesthetics. Uh, for all their differences, uh, um, and um, the Frankfurt School dimension was very crucial to me because I was a Hegelian and remained um, uh, since then, despite my immersion in French theory and the fact that I was the student of a demand student and, and the full uh, force of that, plus the fact that we have the, at that particular moment the migration westward of the entire Yale School minus demand, which is incredibly influential. Uh, in the atmosphere, okay, in this atmosphere out there, and which is in some ways eccentric, 
and, and, and at some point... Except Jeffrey. Jeffrey didn't come. No, Jeffrey didn't come. It's true. It's true. He, Jeffrey didn't die either. Yes, you're right. But Derry died and Hill is uh, and there. And, but, you know, and this which produced a kind of the deconstruction of the, of the West Coast is significantly different than the one uh, that was uh, produced in, in the East Coast. At some point, these things need to be written. They're beyond the autobiographical. There it really is, it is a fascinating uh, moment in, in the development of, of, uh, of learning in American universities. And, and um, so as radical students um, of one kind or another, and there were incredible uh, and, 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 and sort of outrageous arguments and fights over ridiculous you know, issues typical of the left. Um, the theory question, well, actually wasn't a question. Theory was just the way that one lived radicalism in, in if one was in the literary field. It wasn't even, um, so cultural studies, though it developed exactly like Don described, um, uh, it was a kind of, it, especially in California, it was, was not a, it was an issue that we observed from the standpoint of radical theory. In that sphere, Said was never a problem for me, except I must confess one thing, which was kind of amusing, I told him once, when he came and gave the Jane Austen le lectures, I think the very beginning of them, I was terribly disappointed, because I found them so comprehensible, and I thought something was wrong. So that too is a, is, a, is a symptom, a testimony of a certain symptom. Now, the another thing is what it resonates with what Amir says, has said, and Ronald too. Uh, for me, anyway, this was the time where what was later understood to be post-colonial criticism came into full front, not as a theory, but by the coexistence, the presence of, of students from all kinds of places in the world who, uh, who were uh, entirely, theor the, their theoretical learning was beyond doubt, and there was not, again, not an issue. They, they knew all the French theory and everything, and all the German theory, and all the, the theory from their own uh, provenan uh, provenance uh, as well. And the coming together of this, uh, of this, uh, uh, the, the coming together of these modes of thinking from different places it was crucial in shifting from the kind of typical theory that we now uh, understand, the anti humanist and so on, to the other one. Said, in this sense, was crucial. But the experience within a decade, from 1981 to 1990, was in some ways seamless. It, I, I, I understand that in some ways it kind of gets the grain of, 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 uh, of what some experiences are different. Um, so it's the question of whether Said is a Marxist or not, whether his relationship to Marxism is definitely a false question, for all kinds of reasons that, that people have already said. But that, that Said was a radical thinker in, in ways that actually uh, only in recent years, I understand the magnitude of radicalism. Even in those days, I didn't understand it. That was also no doubt uh, about, you know, about that. You were not troubled by the early 80s statement of Edward that he was turning away from theory, which was more or less contemporary with the Matt Ed Michaels against theory pieces in critical theory? I never, could, I never put them together in that way. I think that my reading of, of Said was really um, I, I didn't to, understand the American, yeah. I didn't understand the struggles within the, a, a, a really U.S. sort of American uh, um, uh, intellectual community. I, I inhabited an international intellectual community. community but in, where his, in his own work, you could be, see from the late 70s through the early 80s, a the growing dissatisfaction. I know, I know, it's a very good question. Theory. Very good question. Well, well, I, can answer. Answer. I can only answer it by, by uh, speaking <laughs> experientially. I had no trouble uh, uh, reading this work and, and, and having this work provoke me uh, at the same time that I would continue reading uh, my Derrida and my Foucault in the same vein. Because this you talk, your talk shows exactly why. It, it, this because remains. It remains true of my work to this day. And I have no problem with this. Tom, 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 for you Tom, Tom. was always already totally within theory. At the same time, he was, as he was saying, he was separating from theory. He was, you, you couldn't read a sentence of Saeed without, without presupposing that he was already working with what he understood to be the strongest dimension of theory, but also refusing the doctrinaire, what, it, what had become through the Yale School a doctrinaire position. Yes. But we're leaving out the Foucault, West Coast Foucault. 
And Foucault was the oh, other. Wait, 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 I'm sorry, I'm going to stop you for a second. This is very important, but we've got other people waiting. So let's hear those questions and then we will pile, we will pile up, okay? So we have, I have Lindsay and then Blob in order to we'll come back to the office. I know, I know. Don't lose that thought. Lindsay. I don't think I have any questions anymore. I just, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I could say, I could say um, this underlines something that somebody said before. This, the question is put by Stanley Fish to, but you've told me this story before. Put, put by Stanley Fish to, to Said, if you're a Marxist, how come you're wearing such a splendid tie? <laughs> and and well, he if says, you're a revolutionary, why are you wearing such a And he says, in my idea of the revolution, anybody who wants to wear a tie like this will be able to wear it. And he said the same thing about a couple of years later at the MLA when there was a panel of about 50 people, maybe just 15, um, saying, no, it was after cultural imperialism came out, and they're saying, oh, you're so wonderful, you're bringing down the power structures, they're going to be, the world's never going to be the same. And at the end, when he was about to speak, he said, I don't want to live in a world that sounds like the world that you guys are talking about. Uh, a world in which people can't take pleasure in those little pleasures of, of aesthetic experiences. I don't want to have any part of it, so I don't want to part of your revolution. But that didn't mean he didn't want the revolution. But he, didn't, he didn't want that. Um, I've also, another little anecdote is, Demand saying to me, um, the New Republic had asked Demand to review Michael Ryan's book about what was that about? Who is Michael Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and 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 and, and Demand Demand says, you know, I'm not going to review that book because, in honesty, I'd have to say it's a piece of crap. It's not his language, um, but I'm really, I'm just, I'm more of a Marxist than than, than even Fred. And what does that mean? Uh, but. Um, of course, Demand had promised for years that he would actually write about Marx. Well, but part of the thing that, that, that developed, you guys have not been talking about it, cultural studies and culture, all that talk about culture went bad. Um, but for lots of reasons that, that there would take a long time to explain. How the people out in, but there's also this East Coast, West Coast thing, you know, it was Tupac versus Biggie. It was, it was, so the, 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 the rappers on the East Coast, the rappers on the West, rappers on the West Coast were the were people like uh, were all the fishes. I, I believe no, 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 they ain't got shit to do with this. Uh, fish, fish was fish was the continue. He was Reaganism, uh, and 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 then and new historicism was a version of Reaganism. Um, but um, and the way in which I wish. That the new historicist, how do I they choose that name? That's not a good name to have chosen. But they did choose it. And that became a dot. Whether most people connected with Bobby Chu do not want to believe that there's anything significant about those people. And there's nothing that, we're, that I'd be particularly interested in knowing about those people, except they did manage to take over a lot of the English departments in the United States. Ironically, they influenced Yale to shorten the. PhD dissertation because, in fact, new historicism was the mechanism by which dissertations were made largely second, second rate pieces. And the attempt to destroy the Yale English department after DeMond died was, which was largely carried on by people inside of Yale, but as well as other people outside, was very harmful. Uh, I, I, I'll start with one simple observation, and that is that uh, what I've been hearing it was a very, very good example of what to my ears always sounds like the American idiom. I've been to a revival meeting with witnessing the around <laughs> 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 uh, I, I think that the question that you ask um, is one that does deserve some reference to historical objectivity. Uh, and I would just suggest two events at the beginning of the 1980s that are quite significant. When Layton steps down as president of Stanford University and becomes president of the Rockefeller Foundation, he provokes a discussion <coughs> at the foundation about what are going to be the 40 leading research universities in the United States and how they will be recognized and what will be the place of the humanities and how the humanities will be funded in that enterprise. And he calls a meeting of the other major foundations and this is how the centers for the humanities begin to be funded around the country. That, interestingly enough, precipitates, precipitates a crisis back at Stanford 
because he can't move any of this money back to Stanford uh, because it would be a little bit too obvious. So the Stanford faculty starts revising the curriculum by introducing a world curriculum. That gets attacked on the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal by all the Thatcherites who were moved deliberately by Margaret Thatcher to occupy positions in American publishing. And that then brings about the nomination of Lynn Cheney to the head of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And in 1983, she purges, that is the term to be used, she purges the lists of people who are going to be reviewers of proposals to be sent to the NEH. And her list includes semioticians, feminists, deconstructionists, phenomenologists, can you imagine? <laughs> Phen <laughs> phenomenologists, I didn't know that she knew the word. Uh, and interestingly enough, not Marxists in that particular moment. And the NEH changes orientation. Those are objective facts. Around that, we can now read that personal narratives. I would trouble the distinction between personal objective and world archive. But if you was that, you gave a certain testimonial flavor to that. Also, there was not a single reference to what I was doing. On the <laughs> question then does strike me as to whether or not there remains anything in Edward's achievements like <coughs> his Nachlas living or scripted that we have not yet touched upon that people would like to try to bring to the surface. We, we have had one brief, I think, only reference to music not really very much said about why it was so significant or how it was significant. Somebody talked about, I used to get phone calls. Oh, yes. Yeah. The strangest time. Five o'clock. You know, it, it late at night, early in the morning. And those phone conversations were really great. Was, was that part of what Edward did? Was that part of his... But did that, others have that experience yes. where Edward would call? He would call me on Friday evenings chewing a sandwich. <laughs> tell me all kinds of things. On the way to the opera. On his way to the concert of the opera. And before and after the conversation, as the conversation began, and he always had this phrase in it, you don't write an opera. Well, he would tell me that I was writing for a coterie audience. I had to change the way in which I, why didn't I try out different genres? Why didn't I want to address a larger public? He was thinking about people as embodied ways in which work gets done or not done in my case. But what questions, what materials in his body of work or in his career remain untouched but about which you would like to say more or hear more? Or what about his work might point a different direction than those we've already touched upon? Well, perhaps it should be mentioned that he was always extremely kind to creative writers and very generous. Mm -hmm. And I met him on, well, very many occasions, but I remember meeting him in Cape Town. He came to give a talk, and then he came to our house for dinner. And all that night, he did not mention anyone other than maybe because Mindy Gordon was also <coughs> there. Uh, he didn't, it didn't seem as though he had as much respect for his, you know, for the critics <laughs> as much as he had for the, for the work, for the selling, primary yeah. work that was being done, because he, he, he divided it into you know, primary and non in other words, he was saying that uh, one could one could exist and live on without secondary work. Because the, the primary work must be done. And every time I met him, he, he would always talk about primary, primary work. And then his also his 
because he lived in that ambiguous zone, ambiguous area, not being truly any nationality. Well, I mean, the, the question of whether he was American or you know, being an Egyptian this and that and the other one. None of these things took as an important a space as the fact that he was interested in spreading the word about the books that he loved. So that the books that he loved, he once, uh, yeah, especially, you know, because he knew that I could read Arabic, he would very often mention, whenever I met him, he would mention the latest book in Arabic that he's read, and he'd be raving about it. Um, so that, that I think is, is something that that struck me as being generous and willing to negotiate and engage in so many things. One of the elements of his writing about Vico, which often I've never seen anyone right, comment on really, is his interest in a uh, founding moment in the new science where Vico says essentially we have two problems as human beings. We have problems of what to do with the dead body and what to do with women. <laughs> and I've forgotten the exact text at this moment. I think you <laughs> Yes? Uh oh. Yes. yes. But Saeed transliterated. You're out there on your own, by the way. Saeed This is the reason why this passage, I'm sure, has never been asked. But Saeed transliterates this question what do you do about women? into the beginning of a metaphoric two or three paragraphs about the romances of reading being undifferentiated from the, as he said, he said, the love of women, making love of women. So this book, intersection between sexuality, romance, heterosexual love, the act of reading, all of that is juxtaposed to this problem back to this morning, what you do with the dead body. And so letting a book die, as someone said earlier, is a terrible thing. Not expressing your love for those books that can make you love them. And books that make you love them are books that themselves are capable of having love, right? So books that you love even though you know there's problems with them. So I think the one of the difficulties with saying is attached to this problem, is, is especially as he went along, I think he changes a little bit from being a university man to being a writer. Right? I think one of the unspoken problems to address the ethics question is that some of the things that might identify some of the ethical tendencies are words like love, which are very hard to circulate in the academy these days. I think I don't know what to do with it. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Paul.